the 60s weren't the best time for Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Surrounded by discrimination and segregation, this time was filled with turmoil. Among those residing in this town was Joyce and Leonel Dahmer, who were waiting on the arrival of their first child. Joyce Dahmer was born on February 7, 1936 to her parents Floyd and Lillian, who were of Norwegian and German descent. It is unknown when Joyce and Leonel got married, but soon enough, Joyce became pregnant with their first child. According to Leonel, during her pregnancy with her first child, Joyce would take prescription drugs, however, this was dismissed by Joyce. May 21st, 1960, Joyce gave birth to a baby boy and he was named Jeffrey. Dammer's upbringing was far from a happy family unit. His father was too busy doing doctoral studies, often absent from home, while his mother was alleged to be mentally unstable after giving birth. According to one source, Joyce started to show unstable behaviour and continuously complained about noises from neighbours and needed constant reassurance from her husband. This led Joyce to have to increase her antidepressants. As a toddler, Dahmer was described as happy and pretty much normal for his age. He loved stuffed bunnies and wooden blocks, however he was often sick with ear and throat infections. At the age of four, he had to undergo surgery to correct a double hernia in his head. Brain surgery can have a lifelong effect on an individual's personality and mood. The brain can be split into four sections, the temporal, frontal, occipital and parietal lobe. The theory of localization would suggest that these four areas of the brain are in charge of certain functions. For example, the frontal lobe is responsible for voluntary movement, expressive language and managing a higher level of executive functioning. Executive functioning just describes a combination of cognitive skills such as controlling responses to achieve goals, self-monitoring and having a capacity to plan. But relating this back to Dahmer, according to his parents after his surgery, Dahmer became quite a loner. Dahmer began preschool and according to his teachers he was quite shy. He showed an interest in animals and insects and once helped his father nurse a bird back to health. He ended up doing this a few times with other animals too. During this year, Dahmer's younger brother was born. Dahmer's parents allowed him to name his brother and he chose the name David. While Jeffrey loved spending time with his brother, he grew extremely jealous of him and felt as though David was stealing the love which his parents used to show him. From this point until Dahmer began high school, it had been reported that Dahmer had become quite strange. He began to collect roadkill, bleaching bones of chickens, keeping insects in jars of formaldehyde, decapitating small rodents and he also learned how to use acid in order to strip meat from bones of dead animals. Some point before starting high school, it was also reported that Dahmer had been sexually abused by a neighbour. At the age of 14, Dahmer joined high school. He became part of the school band playing the clarinet. However, despite his attempts to interact with school life, he was also becoming a heavy drinker. It was at this point when Dahmer also had his first homosexual experience and began to fantasise having sex with a corpse. He soon became known as the alcoholic loner of high school. He continued to collect the remains of dead animals so that he could strip the flesh from their bones and even mounted a dog's head on a stake. Using chalk, he would also draw the outline of bodies and school floors. At the age of 18, Dahmer's parents decided to divorce. It seems as though this was the trigger that began everything. Stephen Hicks was just 18 years old. He was described as a deeply caring person and had graduated high school in Coventry Township, Ohio. He was hitchhiking a ride to a rock concert. When Dahmer picked him up, he brought him back to his parents' home. Jeffrey promised Stephen a few beers and then a ride to the concert. Jeffrey's behaviour began to grow quite strange and Stephen began to feel very uncomfortable and decided it was time to leave. Jeffrey didn't like this and using weights that he had in the house, he hit Stephen with a dumbbell before strangling him. Dahmer then dissected Stephen's body in the basement at his family's home before burying his remains in the garden. Later that year, Jeffrey's father forced him to enlist in the army. He served as combat medic in Germany until 1981, in which he was then dismissed due to his drinking problems. His drinking problems continued to cause issues and Jeffrey's father decided it was time for him to live with his grandmother. There, Dahmer would frequently go to gay bathhouses, where he would drug and rape men. He was arrested twice for indecent exposure in 82 and 86. However, he only faced probation and was never charged with rape. In 1983, Jeffrey also began a new job at a blood plasma centre. He would steal vials of blood to take home and drink. His family found out about this problem and rather than getting him help, which he clearly needed, they decided to do nothing. Stephen Toomey was a quiet and artistic 28-year-old. 
He was described as a lively, cheerful man and seemed to love life and was always ready to help others. It was believed that Dammer and Toomey had crossed paths at a bar in Wisconsin. Dammer used his charm to flirt and show his interest in Toomey. The two decided to spend the night in a room at a nearby hotel. Dammer later recalled that he had no intentions of taking Toomey's life and felt extremely attracted to him. However, he proceeded to still drug the boy. Jeffrey claimed that he only intended to lie beside the young man, however, when he awoke, he saw that Toomey's chest was caved in in an attempt to rip out his heart. Toomey was last seen on September 15, 1987, and became the only victim Dammer was not charged of due to a lack of evidence. Jimmy Dock's Taylor loved to play pool and ride his bike. He was only 14 years old at the time of his death. Two days before meeting Dammer, Jimmy had run away from home in order to escape his abusive stepfather. His worried mother had reported his disappearance to the police at the time, but never heard anything. Jimmy met Dammer outside of a gay club. Dammer offered the boy money to pose for nude photos, and then led him back to his grandmother's house. Jeffrey began initiating sexual activities with the young boy. He then drugged him and strangled him to death. Jeffrey then left Jimmy's body in the basement of his grandmother's house for a week. Once Jeffrey was sure his grandmother wouldn't catch him with the body, he proceeded to dismember the teenager's body before dissolving the flesh in acid. Richard's family knew Richard would not be returning home when he went missing in March 1988. His sister said that Richard would always let his mother know where he was and even when her brother was in trouble with the law, the first thing he did was call his mother. So when Richard went missing and did not call, they knew that eventually they would receive the bad news. On the night of his death, Richard was offered $50 to bring Dammer back to his grandmother's house. At the time, Richard had only $3 in his pocket, so it seemed like an easy way for him to get money. Dammer ended up drugging Richard, then strangled him. He proceeded to have sex with Richard's corpse, dismembering his body afterwards. Dammer then disposed of his corpse in the bin. Anthony Sears aspired to be a model and was saving money to leave Milwaukee. His mother Marlon said he loved having his photo taken and often went off with friends for days at a time so he ended up not being reported missing until four weeks after he had been gone. Anthony met Dammer at a gay club. Anthony's friends gave him and Jeffrey a lift back to Jeffrey's grandmother's house and that was the last time anyone seen Anthony. Dammer brought Anthony inside his grandmother's house where they had sex and Dammer gave him a drink that put him to sleep. Once Sears fell asleep, Dammer killed and dismembered his body mummifying his head and penis while the rest of his body was disposed. He eventually boiled his face by removing the skin and kept his skull as a souvenir. Two years after his murder, Anthony's remains were identified as one of Dammer's victims. Around the time of this charge, Jeffrey was put on trial for child molestation. Dammer's defence counsel believed Jeffrey needed help and decided to allow him to work during the day, but he would have to stay in prison overnight for the next year. Soon after his release from prison, he was back to killing again. Jeffrey moved out of his grandmother's house and into his own apartment after his year in prison, and he soon met a 32-year-old sex worker. Raymond became Dammer's seventh victim in 1990. Dammer offered him $50 if he came home with him. Dammer once again drugged and raped Raymond Smith, taking photos of Smith's corpse. He then dismembered Raymond's body, leaving the skull preserved so that he could keep it beside Anthony's remains. Edward Smith was an acquaintance of Dammer. He was 27 year old and the pair had been seen together at pubs previously. Edwards attempted to be friends with Dammer and in return Dammer killed him, stashing some of his body in the freezer until they began to degrade and fall apart. Ernest Miller's murder differed from the other killings. Instead of drugging and strangling the victim, Dammer chose to cut Miller's throat. Dammer also ate parts of Miller's body and according to Dammer this is where the cannibalism started and eating his victims made him feel like they were a part of him. Only three weeks after Miller's death, Dahmer lured Thomas back to his apartment where he drugged and strangled him. However, this time he would not keep any of Thomas's body parts. Curtis Strotter was only 17 years old when Dahmer offered him money for nude photos. Curtis agreed to go back to Dahmer's apartment where he was drugged, strangled and photographed, then dismembered. Dammer then kept parts of Strother's body to trophy and cannibalise. According to sources, Lindsay had the most agonising death of all Dammer's victims due to Jeffrey's attempts to experiment on the 19-year-old. Lindsay was drugged, then Dammer drilled a hove into Lindsay's head, pouring hydrochloric acid into the hole. 
Dammer hoped that Lindsay would remain alive but subdued in a zombie-like state. However, Lindsay woke up complaining of a headache and Dammer ended his life by strangling him. Jeffrey met 31-year-old Anthony at a gay bar. He was deaf and agreed to go home with Jeffrey where he was drugged and strangled. Conorak was the younger brother of the boy Jeffrey assaulted three years prior. He led the 14-year-old back to his apartment where Hughes' body also remained on the floor. Dammer attempted his experiment once again, but this time he injected the hydrochloric acid rather than pouring it. Conorak managed to escape Dammer's apartment once Dammer was out for a while. Dammer returned home to find his victim talking to a woman on the street. Conorak was said to seem very woozy and the woman alerted the police. Once the police arrived, Dammer somehow managed to convince them that Conorak and him had a quarrel and the young boy was in fact a 19 year old. He then took the young boy back to his apartment where he attempted his experiment once again, killing the 14-year-old. Matthew Turner was just like the previous victims of Dahmer. He was convinced to go back to Dahmer's apartment where he was drugged, strangled and dismembered. Dahmer preserved some of Turner's body in his freezer and his skull was kept as a trophy. Jeremy was lured back to Dahmer's apartment and after four days, Dahmer drugged his drink. Once Jeremiah became unconscious, he attempted the experiment once again, drilling a hole into the young man's head. He injected hydrochloric acid and boiling water into the frontal lobe. Jeremiah regained consciousness but was very groggy. Dammer drugged him once again and Jeremiah ended up slipping into a coma. Dammer ended up strangling Jeremiah and then he severed his head, placing it into the freezer. The rest of Jeremiah's body was dismembered by a chainsaw and his torso was stored in a 57 gallon drum which was filled with acid. Oliver Lacey became a victim of Dammer's within the same two weeks as Jeremiah. He was lured back to Dammer's apartment after being offered money to pose for photos. Lacey was drugged, strangled and dismembered. Joseph became Dammer's final victim. He was a father of three. Only four days after killing Oliver, Joseph was lured back to Dammer's apartment by offering money to pose for photos again. He was drugged, strangled and later dismembered. Dammer kept Joseph's head and torso in the freezer. Dammer approached three men offering $100 to accompany him to his apartment for nude photos, drink beer and keep him company. Tracy Edwards, a 32 year old, agreed to Dammer's offer. When they arrived at Dammer's apartment, Tracy began to feel quite uneasy. The apartment was obsessively tidy but the air was filled with a putrid odour. Dammer blamed the smell on faulty sewers and Tracy was given a rum and coke and was led towards Dammer's fish tank, stepping over four large cartons of acid. Tracy began to realise that he was most likely in a lot of danger right now and Dammer placed a pair of handcuffs around Tracy's left wrist and pressed a military knife against Tracy's ribcage. Tracy asked Dammer what was happening and Dammer told him it was all just a joke and led Tracy towards his bed saying the keys for the handcuffs were in there. Dammer's room was covered in posters of men and a video of The Exorcist 2 was playing. Dammer told Tracy that he wouldn't hurt him as long as he let him keep the handcuffs on him and take some pictures of him while he was nude. Tracy then told Dammer he would only let him take pictures if he put the weapon away. Dammer sat on the edge of the bed, rocking slowly and watching The Exorcist too. He held the knife to Tracy's throat, chanting incantations. At this point, Tracy was lying on the floor and Dammer lay his head on Tracy's chest, telling him he was beautiful. He told Tracy he wanted to listen to his heart beating and said he was going to eat Tracy's heart. Tracy tried to tell Dammer what he wanted to hear and told Dammer he would do whatever he wanted as soon as the handcuffs were taken off him. Dammer turned to get the key and Tracy ran towards the door. Dammer ran after him and swung a blade at him which Tracy dodged and hit Dammer in the groin. Dammer grabbed Tracy's arm and begged him to come back but Tracy managed to free himself and go out onto the street where he managed to get the attention of a passing police car. The police believed that they were dealing with a case of domestic violence at the time. Tracy asked if they had a key which could unlock the handcuffs but they didn't so Tracy had to lead the officers back to Dammer's flat so that they could retrieve the key and get the handcuffs off Tracy. Back at the apartment Dammer was cooperative and told police where to find the key. An officer went into Dammer's room to retrieve the key where he noticed a large knife and pictures of joints of meat. The officer soon realised that this was actually human body parts. 
Dammer was wrestled to the ground and Tracy told police about a passing comment Dammer previously made about something in the fridge. One of the officers opened the fridge to find the head of a previous victim. More officers soon arrived in the scene and a freezer containing three heads, a torso, plastic bags filled with flesh and a cupboard full of chemicals and two bleached skulls were all found. There was a complete skeleton and two other skulls in a box. Dammer's kettle contained two hands and a set of genitals. Found sane and charged with 17 counts of murder, Dammer was sentenced to more than 900 years in prison, but he only served three before a fellow inmate bludgeoned him to death. death. Your Honour, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I am so sorry for that, and sorry for everyone else that I have hurt. I have hurt my mother and father and stepmother. I love them all so very much. I hope that they will find the same peace I am looking for. It is quite clear that from childhood, Dammer had some psychological issues going on. With his strange interest in roadkill to pretending to outline dead bodies in school, it was obvious that Dammer needed serious psychological help which probably could have prevented all of these deaths from happening. Dammer was eventually diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, psychotypical personality disorder and psychotic disorder. However, despite these diagnoses, he was found legally sane at his trial. While Dammer was a monster, part of me can't help but feel as though he, along with his victims, were greatly failed. It's quite clear that this hysteria was so preventable and had Jeffrey's family done something earlier, when they seen him collecting blood vials, so many people may not have lost their lives and Jeffrey may have gotten the help he needed. As mentioned in the start of the video, Jeffrey did not seem to have the best childhood. His father was gone for the most part studying while his mother had her own mental health problems to deal with and it just seems that Jeffrey may have been neglected quite a bit. The impact which this type of abuse can have on a child is detrimental to their development. While females who experience abuse tend to internalise this by having low self-esteem or eating disorders, Males tend to externalise this by becoming very aggressive towards others. As well as this, being neglected by his parents, Dammer often seen his parents getting into verbal arguments which can have a lasting impact on a child's psychological well-being. Personally, I believe this neglect and loneliness is what stemmed his fear of being alone and which may explain why he kept so many bodies in his home. Personally, I think it's quite clear that so much could have been done to prevent what happened. Since these murders, psychology has advanced greatly and continues to advance every day with new research findings. Perhaps people can't see past the acts which Dahmer committed, which is quite understanding that it would be difficult to see Dahmer than nothing but a heartless killer, but I do believe that had help been put in place, perhaps all these young men would not have lost their lives so soon. Let me know what you think. Do you think Dahmer's actions were the cause of his later diagnosis or was he just a cold-hearted murderer? Thank you for watching and if you enjoyed this please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe because it really helps me out a lot. And if you have any cases you'd like me to cover next, leave them in the comments below. Hopefully I'll see you in another video.